tank mates welcome back everybody <laughs> you, you, you take it over the podcast you, I'm taking you intro over. all right do it go you, you do it <laughs> Where do you start fresh go <laughs> take the only thing i have <laughs> <laughs> i didn't know that you no go weren't. ahead seriously no seriously um well welcome back to aquariums unfiltered my fellow tank mate <laughs> <laughs> in today's episode <laughs> All right, I'll take it from here, Captain Awkward. <laughs> you do, you do good. Uh, welcome back to another episode of Aquariums Unfiltered, my fellow tank mates. Come on in, have a seat. Take a seat. I do. I will not let you guys forget the, what I've done for you. <laughs> Today's podcast is going to be a little interesting. Uh, we got an interesting guest coming on, and um, an expert in biotopes traveled all over the place looking at different areas and going under the water and seeing the environments and habitats of fish in the wild uh and that is going to be something moving forward that i'm going to be doing um i think i tried to talk about it in the last episode but of course i forgot to turn the mics on because of this is an amateur show and i am an amateur um but i'll be selecting friends and people that i know and you know sometimes you guys will know them at other times and a lot of the times you're gonna have no clue who they are but i know a lot of cool people and um i think that it's worth having a conversation with them and you know seeing where it goes and i think that uh our fellow tank mates are going to enjoy coming along yeah listening and seeing if there's (laughs) anything in there that's entertaining or not most people are watching these while they do their water changes and or commuting to work and that sort of thing as well some people have tvs above their tanks and they're kind of they're listening and you know it just it just kind of breaks up the air especially if you're if you're alone or if you are working on your aquarium you just have something to listen to Mm -hmm. you know that's made by like-minded people that do what you do and enjoy what you enjoy and you know we're having that type of fun and um yeah, but the downside is is some people won't know who some of the guests are. Um, yeah. And that's kind of the whole point because yeah. when you do watch podcast, I don't know every guest they have. And I'm not saying we're always going to have guests, but mm-hmm. some people you'll know, some people you won't. And um, either way, I think uh, there's no preference. Yeah, and you a lot of the times get introduced to somebody new that you end up really enjoying and learning about what they have to talk about. Yeah, and it's been... Um, it's been pretty interesting, pretty fun. Mm-hmm. Uh, I enjoyed the last one that we just did and with Graham. Or, I'm sorry, with Jim. Jim. Yim. James <laughs> Yako. Yako. <laughs> that was good. Um, in retrospect, I don't really think we talked about a lot besides telling stories. Just talking. Yeah. Like, you're just hanging out. Yeah. And uh, that can be cool. Like, some people are like, oh, y- y- they call these interviews or something. I'm not interviewing anybody. Mm-hmm. I'll try to ask questions, keep conversations going or whatever. But for the most part, it's like if you just were to meet somebody for the first time you guys just talk about things that you both like or have in common that's all this is yeah i guess i gotta stop talking about that too because almost every podcast i'm like (laughs) (laughs) this is what it's about yeah this is what the podcast is going to do (laughs) what are we into episode like 13 or 14 or something Something like that that. yeah i think 14 and we're just (laughs) i'm still like explaining (laughs) what this is i think i think at this point everybody knows uh i'm having a blast i'm enjoying it sometimes it's a little stressful like with the equipment and stuff i'm not good with that um, I don't have uh, much of a knack or care for setting all this up and doing it, but I've gotten it to the point where I don't have to move anything. You know, mm-hmm. I might have to move the odd camera out of the way, just one of them technically that's over there. Yeah. If you want to hit it. Mm, like. Yeah, that one, which is up against the 2000. And now, of course, that's going to get in the way, but I like this. Mm-hmm. I like being able to look um, and see all the tanks around us. Take mm-hmm. us on a trip around the world. Yeah. Yeah. I like the yeah for everyone. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> These are great. <laughs> look at all my fish tanks, internet. <laughs> oh, look, it's Kevin. Mm, oh, yeah. Right there. I moved Kevin last <laughs> night. Kevin, well, I set up Kevin in an aquarium just for him, and I am going to put a couple more of the other guys up there, but right now I'm just uh, um, seeing what Kevin would be like on his own, but I am going to put some th- things up there. Kevin can't have any coral in the tank. He could have them originally until I switched him aquariums, and then all of a sudden all of the bubble tip anemones became food. Every piece of coral that I had became an opportunity to fill his ever-growing guts. And, um, oh, well, that's what it is. I shouldn't have trusted him. As long him. as we keep him happy. Yeah, true. Yeah. Kevin's got to be happy. He's going to riot. So I think our guest today is uh, waiting and ready, but 
always try to make sure that um, they come in right on top. He's in there. He's waiting, so we might as well bring him in. Uh, his name is Michael Salutin. I met him through um, Mark Chen, TMK Aquarist, okay. right after the podcast. And I could tell, like, right after the podcast, Mark was a little relieved it was over. Right. Uh, I think he was just nervous. And then we had the best conversation. I remember that. And I was yeah. thinking to myself, like, why couldn't we talk like this on the <laughs> podcast? <laughs> like, so they, when I invite people on, I guess maybe they do get a little nervous and stuff. But, you know, there's no pressure. Mm -hmm. And if we don't like it, we don't put it out. Or if it doesn't turn out very well. And some yeah. of the podcasts yeah. we've filmed, sometimes they don't end up getting going to the public. And yeah. um, it has nothing to do with that person or whatever. It's just, you know, maybe... Um, you know the vibe was off or something who knows mm -hmm. i try to put them out uh, all of them anyways um but for the most part this is just my way of getting to talk to my friends and make new friends like uh jim jim's my friend now yeah uh, all right let's bring michael in and see what he's got to say uh i was really interested in his uh and when he was telling me everything until we'll see we'll see how it works out once he's in here mm -hmm. maybe he doesn't know what he's talking about <laughs> I wonder if he could hear us. I, can't, I don't know if they could hear us, but if he is, it'll be funny. So let's go ahead and bring him in. See if he's ready. Hello. There he is. What's up, Michael? Hello. Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Hear you. I, I'm here at the studio with Mark. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was, I'm was. i assuming that... Uh, very <laughs> Tell him he had his time. Tell Mark to shut his mouth now. <laughs> 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 could you hear us talking before? I did, yeah. yeah. I heard you guys yeah. talking before. Yeah, we just do a little little blurb, but then I realized, you know, we'd probably be able to do it for 15 minutes and might be waiting for us. Um, but yeah, Michael, we'll go or we'll go ahead and get you to introduce yourself. Okay. Oh, just one second, sorry. Uh, so there's some technical issue. I don't know what it is. I'm just trying to change it for him to to like the side by side. Okay, there. We oh, go. here we go. Okay, yeah, that looks what I like. What I should be seeing. Anyways, uh great you can see my whole body now <laughs> i can would you like a tour oh mark never got all the camera views before oh, yeah. i switched up the cameras and added a bunch i'll show you a few little angles for you so you can see the entire room cool yeah we'd love to see that oh, oh that's wow. the one i was looking at yeah oh that's then, a nice, nice. view Ooh. oh you can see everything from here yeah. Dude, look at that pro setup yeah. Oh, awesome. yeah pro setup by yeah, what I love people about Joey is basically he he like if he he wants to do some stuff like he, he does it right no, I don't. <laughs> I just go nuts. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. People are gonna ask you, nice virtual background, but that's not one, is it? <laughs> no. It's your actual setup there. Yeah. Yeah. So Michael Saluta, we were talking about um, how we were podcasting with uh, with Mark, and then once we were done, you introduced yourself as one of his partners, and you started talking about yourself, and I thought it was interesting. And you want to tell me all kinds of stories, and I had to cut you off. I was like, this is a podcast. I want to talk about it on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are. Um, so Michael Salutin, is that how you say that? Yes, that's right. Yeah, let's get a little information on yourself. Uh, you know, tell everybody who you are. Um, so I'm, I'm originally from Canada. and um, Ooh, I've Where in Canada? In Sorry. Uh, I was born in Toronto, and I grew up in Saskatchewan, oh. in Saskatoon, actually. Oh. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, and uh, and I've lived in BC for a while as well. But um, after that, I lived in Italy, Thailand, um, and Bahrain in the Middle East. So I've lived a few places, and I'm only kind of recently back to North America, actually. So yeah. Um, so what do you want to know? I mean, uh, I <laughs> I've been keeping aquarium since I was a kid, and that was my first job was in aquarium shops. So. Well, I'm gonna. Um, I'm probably gonna peg you as like a. Um, pause. I probably shouldn't say I'm gonna peg you, but I'm going to <laughs> label you as an expert uh, on biotypes and biotopes. Um, it seems as though you had a lot to say before we did the podcast, and I was like, I'm really interested um, because I find myself uh, uh, being somewhere between a biotope and a fish keeper hobbyist where I like them to have something that makes sense for the actual fish that we're keeping. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to what uh, a lot of people do is set up an aquarium that's... For themselves. Well, yeah, that's very aesthetically pleasing yeah. and rule of thirds and all that stuff. And yeah. when, you, when you do go... So let's get a definition of what you believe a biotype is. Are you familiar with like biotypes okay. and biotopes? So, I mean, uh, we use the word biotope 
Um, I'm not actually that happy with that word sometimes. Um, I don't think that what we do with aquariums are biotopes. I think mm. they should be called ecotopes, which is a little bit more specific than a biotope. So a biotope is, the definition of a biotope in the wild is like an area that's uniform habitat, right? So it could be like a section of a river where certain fish, plants, and and conditions occur, or it could be the middle of the river. There's there's many, many different biotopes, but it's an area that you will find, you know, only specific plants, animals, and even geology and so on in that place, that specific place. And to me, biotopes are actually a little bit too big to reproduce in captivity. For the most part, uh, you would need a public aquarium to do that. Mm. Uh, but what you can reproduce are called ecotopes. Um, so that's what most people think of as an actual biotope, which is a real, real small zoom in mm -hmm. of a biotope where you have like a little section of the marginal plant, say on a stream in a black water in a specific part of near Letitia in the near the Amazon, right? Some very specific location. Yeah, so you use the exact kind of recreate. the exact plants, the exact fish, the exact substrate, everything from that yeah, little so, sliver. I mean, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I don't think they can exist sliver. in an aquarium mm -hmm. because they just don't. Yeah. I'm like, you yeah. can get close. I mean, so, so this is the point. Like, um, I've been um, doing, I've been the judge, one of the judges for the biotope aquarium design contest for the past 10 years, uh, which is um, been more and more successful. I think every year, more and more people, hundreds and hundreds of people try to recreate these very specific habitats and they go out of their way to research them. They even go to this, the habitats, like sometimes where they live, if it's in Argentina or something, they go to that river, they photograph it. They photograph it underwater. They get the exact species that are only found there. So those are the real purists, but you don't yeah. have to be in the country to do it. You just have to have some good video footage, uh, some good uh, information on the biotope, and then you try to recreate it as faithfully in captivity as possible. So it's it's a lot of different things coming together. There's the aesthetics, and then mm -hmm. there's the kind of biology and uh, unique sort of evolution that's occurred in that place. And then there's the realistic appearance uh, of the place. And then there's a sort of educational aspect, like a lot of people never seen that place before, right? Mm -hmm. Underwater. So now you know that this place exists and you can talk about if that place is threatened, if that place you know, is vulnerable, and uh, to be honest, like these freshwater habitats, they don't get a lot of attention uh, compared, especially compared to marine. Um, people just don't know they exist. They don't know what's beneath the surface uh, mm. of these places. Well, there's yeah. a, there is a lot of conservation in the coral industry and, and, and in the saltwater side of things. There's a little bit in the freshwater, but not worldwide like coral mm -hmm. uh, and saving all yeah. of these reefs. I mean, uh, all of these natural habitats are a lot of them uh, are under threat due to humans yeah either yep. uh irresponsibly fishing uh deforestation dams dams are a huge one that'll wipe out an entire yep. species um all of these things that we are specifically doing and now mm -hmm. one of the things that always bothered me was like and this one tiny little thing that bothers me you have and it's a massive conversation but when um some people complain that aquarium keepers people in the hobby shouldn't have them because yeah. we're wiping them out in the wild and it's not necessarily factual or or true at, at times uh once we get our hands on them we'll breed them in numbers that can sustain yeah. the hobby yeah. uh yeah. and what is your idea what is your thoughts on um wild caught versus captive uh bred are you against either one or for one more so or Yes and no. Yeah. I mean, it's such a complex question, and this is something I love it when people ask me because I get to tell them <laughs> what I know about it, yeah. which is that there are wild-caught species that are overfished. Mm -hmm. There are other wild-caught species that can be sustainably caught. Yeah. There are very bad captive breeding operations that lead to very weak fish and, and uh, very bad conditions, and there are great captive breeding efforts. So there is no one you know, size-fits-all for this, you know. Uh, there's, there's, there are different conservation projects out there to sustainably catch wild caught fish and help, you know, uh, sustain local people so that they're not cutting down trees. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a that program, 
buy a you know buy a fish save a tree now how well is it working i don't know but the the concept is very good and then there are other fish that need to be bred in captivity because otherwise they would get over collected in the wild but one thing i've noticed you know all these people who come and say oh it's first of all there's an the animal rights side it's cruel to keep fish at all like you shouldn't keep them at all mm -hmm. and then there's the whole thing like oh they would be in the wild so happy if it wasn't for you and, and they're going extinct because they're being caught well for the most part that's simply not true the destructive things that are going on out there actually a lot of the only people who cared about them are aquarists yeah. even if it's for selfish reasons like we want to have those cool looking fish and we don't want them to disappear because we like to have them in our aquariums mm -hmm. but i mean there was a guy in toronto i have to look him up but he he single-handedly saved several species of rare mexican uh live bears because no one else cared honestly like at that time no conservation organization cared he just kept them in his basement thousands of them and bred them for like 20 years now they're actually reintroducing them to some lakes and things that have been restored uh he's single-handedly saved like half a dozen species just because he cared enough to do it yeah so there's a lot to be said for that i think and do you think you know, nobody the, cares the, about mexican lie bears because they're not that pretty <laughs> see <laughs> this is the thing right they're not the big showy fish either yeah. right they're just little guys they're gonna get forgotten and extincted basically mm -hmm. right out be just out of sheer neglect well if, right? they, if they're not so, fishing for them and doing it responsibly yeah. where where is that entire uh what's that word or that entire uh industry going to go well, how are they going to well, feed yeah, their families I mean, is, in those in those Amazonian this is countries? What, I, what I'm the, so interested in now yeah, is gonna, there are some efforts out there and they need to be stepped up so much. Conservation has to be integrated with local economy and that might be a really good way to do it. But it has to get funding, it has to get support and it has to get knowledge out there because a lot of people, they don't even know where the fish come from. They're like, yeah, the fish are out there somewhere in the water and people catch them like yeah. it's so much more complex than that right and so you have to get out there and educate and i mean that's some something i hope to do and i'm something i hope that the biotope contests and at some point i hope nds as well can help to educate uh get that word out there to the right people uh you know that these habitats are indeed that they exist first of all that they're beautiful and interesting and they have a lot of biodiversity and that they're worth saving and that saving doesn't just mean you you know throw money at it you have to have the, the local people have to be involved is does they have to have a stake in it and it's probably an economic stake and it yeah. has to be sustainable so that involves a lot of different things it involves some wild caught in certain seasons with certain fish yeah it involves some captive breeding with certain fish. It involves relationships with suppliers and not having a sort of reduction in fisheries. Well, there's uh, a lot of fish like that just don't, uh, once we do get a hold of them in the hobby, first and foremost, we'll water them down so they look nothing like their wild, wild counterparts or right. they're missing yep. certain iridescence and colorations mm. that you don't see, uh, especially it's, it's very rampant in, in, in tetras. They lose a tremendous yep. amount of their coloration once we get them into captive breeding and captive raising, which we do need to have wild caught blood. But, yeah. you know, my... Like you said, there's so many different arguments and so many different ways to come at this. You can't just say, you, I'm against wild caught or mm -hmm. I'm against uh, one thing or another. Because, you know, okay, yeah. so imagine banning the importation, which is already being, um, uh, it, it's already being governed, yeah. especially with stingrays. Yeah. Um, there's certain yeah. amounts that are, you're allowed to uh, export from the South America every year. Mm -hmm. Obviously, not everybody's following the rules. But if we take away that, those people that are feeding their families uh, doing it this way, they're going to go find another way, which a lot yep. of the times, one of the most popular industries down there is deforestation. Yeah. And yep. the, uh, and, there's and, deforestation, there's gold mining, there's loads yeah. of things, and they're yeah. very, very destructive. They're w much more destructive than catching a few fish and selling yeah. them. Yeah. So these people um, like so making these rules, they think that they're doing it and they mean well, but it's just they don't understand the full picture. 
Yeah. yeah. I think I think so a lot of the times the government surrounds themselves with people that have no clue what they're talking yeah, about. Yeah, all the time. And they and a lot of the times they'll base decisions off of warm fuzzy feelings and how yeah. and how the general public will perceive this decision, exactly. as opposed yeah. to having yeah. uh, a properly educated. Yeah. Um, you know, plan. having all the information that yeah. they need and require, but uh, very rarely does the government involve anybody that actually knows what they're talking about when it yeah. comes to the aquarium hobby. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. you know, because it's just a fish. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the problem is that whole mentality of it's just a fish. The fish are disposable. Yeah. yeah. Um, I really they don't, don't like realize. that. I mean, yeah, they don't there's a better way, you know, the, 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 the ideal biotope is should have the fish in mind first so even if you might sacrifice aesthetics a little bit for that it's not i mean there's different philosophies and arguments about this too some people consider a biotope to be an aquascaping style i don't no. at all i think it needs to be a sustainable functioning small ecosystem with the fish's needs in mind first yeah and that's first and foremost and then it also needs to i mean i think they should can also be done aesthetically and all of that other stuff as well but i mean there's plenty of beautiful biotopes out there that could be imitated in captivity there's lots of ugly ones too <laughs> yeah and maybe they're not the best to imitate well, i think i think biotopes aren't that popular because ones. yeah but I, I think biotopes aren't as popular as they potentially could be simply because they, a lot of the times they are boring and ugly because no yep. escaping skills are true. technically needed. We, we are trying to replicate what we've but seen in the wild. And when you see discus <laughs> in the wild, that is not pretty. It's not gorgeous, no. lush plants. It's not at all. A variety of color. And they don't look like yep. that in the wild. Um, you yep. know, it's, it's anything from the Amazons coming from murky, muddy water. Aren't betta fish, like, yep. known to be in puddles and stuff? Well, that's a slight myth i mean okay. where they naturally occur yeah they their water dries up and whatnot yeah. and they can survive in very little water but a tremendous amount of fish have to do that in the amazon right. anyway um and well yeah. they're not from the amazon but um i don't think any be be betas are from the amazon no the be betas one this is Just, yeah. from thailand or singapore or something like that um i guess i never wondered where they were from hmm. do you know where the betta is from Oh, they're from, I mean, it just depends. There's so many species of beta, but yeah. the classic beta is from Thailand. Yeah. And there's several species there as well. There's species in Indonesia, Malaysia, and all over Southeast Asia. There's actually dozens and dozens of species of beta. Yeah. And they're, they're an amazing group. Mm -hmm. They're beautiful. another neglected mm -hmm. group. But the, the ones in the attention. wild, nobody wants wild <laughs> cup betas for the most part because the ones that we have are man-made yeah and hand selected yep. and uh have you know those flowy fins and yeah, the that, pretty colors that doesn't happen in the wild they'll have some pretty fins and whatnot but it's not like what we have yep. in the hobby yeah. we we've created yeah. that mm -hmm. um you know tons of fish end up being like that we we've improved on some fish but i think that we take we take the long fin thing a little too far like did you ever see a oh, long we do, yeah. did you ever see a long fin oscar i think I've yeah seen i've seen pictures. that what now there's long fin plecos and long fin everything. Almost. Yeah, I don't mind. A Certain fish, I don't mind. It depends on their original form of their fins. But if the fish has uh, a rounded paddle-like tail fin, there is no reason that needs to be long. Yeah. Because it literally takes away from the Oscar's shape and, and their entire and body and what? why they look yeah. like that in the first place. I just talked about this like, yesterday's video. In the video, yeah. Yeah. Um, about you know the reason their their entire name gives away the why they look like they do mm -hmm. the uh the oscillatus is the you know i believe i think it roughly translates to small eye spot mm -hmm. which yeah. is they're the masters of trickery mm -hmm. you know their body yeah, shape i saw that is video almost, just watched that one yeah and um uh, really like listening to things that are how the fish are evolved and the evolution mm -hmm. you know how why they look the way they look and this is something that I really like with biotopes too, because if you set up a biotope well, it shows its natural behavior because yeah. you give it an environment that looks like, resembles its natural habitat. And those are the, the habitats they evolve to live in. So they'll naturally go into their little niches and roles right there in the tank and show you some cool and interesting behavior that they would not otherwise show. Well, I found just even tank size can triggered. change. Yeah, I, I could find like tank size alone can change everything because a lot of the times yep. we size the, the fish to a tank like, oh, they need a minimum of this and we'll jam them in that. Yeah. But I did a yep. community tank in a 2,000 gallon aquarium and everybody is acting different. Yeah. 
that is and not they what they do in a 180 so or a 120. Faster. Oh, yeah, they just explode and so on. Yeah, because yeah, then they're schooling, they're foraging, they have can set up a, a territory and defend yeah. it. They can do all kinds of things. I mean, when you give them that situation, then you have a little mini National Geographic at home where you get to see all the cool behaviors. To me, that's like half of it. The appeal, not just the way it looks, but the, the fact you get to see their natural behavior uh, that you wouldn't otherwise get to see with a bunch of fish milling around in an overcrowded tank with unnatural conditions, right? So that's a really important thing, I think. And also, I mean, in the contest and so on, one of the rules is you can't really have um, tank strains of things. You have to have the wild strains to show what the wild type looks like and and so on oh. so there's a lot of different arguments over the last few years you know this area has grown in popularity we get mm -hmm. more and more entries you know there was one what biotope contest i don't mean to keep that yet but what contest are you talking about you said contest a few oh times. this is the biotope aquarium design contest um and it's uh, some of the early members were, were were heiko blair he's no longer involved um now it's uh Oleg Labatov and a few others who organized this. And they actually publish a magazine every year of the results. Um, and those have actually made it into Practical Fish Keeping, Amazonas, and a number of other magazines. They're starting to get out there. They're starting to get noticed a lot more. And um, so... Well, I, I think uh, that there's going to be more... sponsors, too. Well, I think there's going to be... What is there? What's the website? Is there a website that we can actually look yeah, at? Yeah, there or? is a website. Um, let me just... Uh, let me just get well you look that up i'll just i'll just um you mentioned like there that you guys got shown in these other magazines i think that um mainstream media and magazines like that i don't think they're going to be around a whole lot longer but mm -hmm. i i do think that niche and very specific things like what you guys are doing will remain and be able yeah. to sustain and become even more and more popular with time because as the hobby evolves everybody wants something different and new mm -hmm. and i think that yep. over time we are slowly getting towards biotypes and biotopes yeah. exclu almost exclusively in the freshwater hobby we're going there we're getting to that direction yep. um so there's there's been a little progress in saltwater too there are some reefers and so on in in Germany that, that try to do biotope reefs, like they'll do try and do a specific reef and things like that. Mm -hmm. And there are even some terrarium and, you know, vivarium people for reptiles and so on that's doing the same thing yeah. where they're trying to do the terrestrial versions of those. And I know a few people are doing that. So it's starting, the idea is starting to spread more to just try to have really natural uh, environment um, for the fish. I'm just trying to bring this up here. Anyway, but yeah, it always, it always starts of like wherever wherever the eyes are, um, and so a long time ago it was like you would be exposed to aquariums at your fish store, yeah, and that's where like yes. the, the multicolored gravel is and all of these crazy decorations and the sunken ship and the treasure chests because those are cute things that and they were really popular and they really helped grow the hobby at one point and then yeah. you know magazines and stuff started coming out and um, you you know being far more popular than almost everything at their time uh, and that's yeah. where you got exposed to different fish and yeah. different setups and scapes and whatnot but now it's the era of social media which has been one of the longest eras that has been continuously dominating everything yeah. um and yeah. be, and and the people that are running social media are aquarium hobbyists now i remember a time when companies all of them have wanted nothing to do with social media i was like well yeah. snooze you lose yeah you, know, you, you should <laughs> jump on board i well, highly they're still trying to catch it. up <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think they're, they're doing. To catch they, up now. They've accepted it now. They never took it serious or even respected any like social media person. I remember how yeah. hard it was to even talk to anybody. Like even ten years ago, when I was kind of just getting into YouTube and whatnot, yeah. like three, four years in, and you know, they're like, Psst, "Who are you?" People nobody, don't like what. They nobody don't cares understand. about you or what you're doing or anything. And well, so I yeah, I, them wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think that so, <laughs> over time, all of this is going to become more and more popular. It's just going it, to, yeah. there just has to be a way where we can make it everything a little more easier and more accessible. Yeah. And yeah. I try to do scapes um, or tank setups that I feel are relatively simple that anybody can do mm -hmm. that is not necessarily um, taken seriously by a, like a professional aquascaper. Yeah. But I'm not trying to impress them. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to yeah. be like them. I'm trying to set up an aquarium that I think the fish is going to look amazing in and interact with it accurately. And in a natural way. Yeah. 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 So this is the point is that natural way. I mean, that's 
it that's not a biotope exactly but it's along the spectrum i would say of biotopes yeah, bio where you want the fish to behave naturally and and also to feel comfortable you know and show their natural behavior that way but i mean what you said about the social media i mean not that long ago there was just one biotope face group now there's like a couple dozen biotope face groups all from all different countries popping mm -hmm. up even in asia and eastern europe and lots of places in mexico um, that even some focus on their local biotopes and they're really into them there's a korean one there's a number also on instagram have popped up and there's mm -hmm. more and more of these uh biotope sort of themed um pages and groups uh popping up and having local small contests and a lot of interest to see just as a challenge how closely can you recreate this habitat now do you need to for the fish is good no you don't but it's just a fun kind of challenge for some people and some people take it really far like they take photos and then they absolutely almost recreate the photo piece by piece mm -hmm. or they do an, an aquascape that's closely inspired by an underwater scene almost like a diorama yeah. and those are quite cool as well so it becomes a challenge to just see how well could you do it how accurately c could you do it could you fool somebody if you had a picture of that and the wild habitat Ooh, and they that's interesting tell the difference? that's what that's i find really idea. that's what i find yeah that's probably the most inspiring thing you said lots yeah. of cool stuff but that's the most that is um that is a nice little catchphrase that yeah. I would continuously repeat over and over and over again. You know, my goal is to trick you mm -hmm. into not yes. knowing if this is, if I were to take a picture, yeah. you wouldn't know that this is an aquarium. Yeah. That's yes. Really this good. is the real, this is the real, in fact, I mean, there, yeah. I, because every other biotype and by everything yeah. that I see, I can tell that's a fish tank. Yeah. That's an aquarium. Yeah. And it's good to make yeah. it like a little bit competitive, like who can do it best because humans are naturally competitive and they will yep. want to see like i want to i yeah. do want to do that and that's that's actually really good yeah, yeah. that's so a contest I mean, in itself people really get into it they get into it uh with a little bit of special effects with the lighting does this look like sunlight coming through mm. the trees does this look like you know um is, is there a tide effect going up and down there are those who do mud skipper biotopes with mud and a tide and the these fish build towers and tunnels and all kinds of cool structures that you would never see otherwise because they need the mud. I gotta do that. And I feel some like... people have made really nice looking ones with crabs and all kinds of different things. Still something a little different, you mm -hmm. know? Um, things that you wouldn't normally get to see. And then there's a few that, you know, you put the fish in and they spawn immediately because they're like, oh, I'm in my natural habitat. Yeah. <laughs> And that's a good indication as well. But there's a f there's just a few that people have, you know, creatively done, and they're like, people ask, oh, so that's the wild habitat, and then that person knows that they've really succeeded mm. yeah. uh, in doing that. See, yeah. that is uh, cool. So yeah, that is cool. That yeah. would be the master. That is the ultimate actual aquascaper. Yeah. And Not it, who can select yeah. plants from all over the world and make them grow, and uh -huh. that's talent too. And I'm not trying to take it away from it, but yeah. I just find this more impressive yeah and it would be yeah. so rewarding to i'll be like curious to see what everybody else thinks that really looks like some like it was underground or under the water yeah yep. that's, that's cool i think if i so, ever do I mean, any of uh, these if i ever do these tanks over again which i can't really see it happening i'll turn this into the biotope gallery i'll <laughs> yeah. change the ooh, name ooh, finally. Ooh, ooh, ooh. well yeah because that's, that's a challenge because that's exciting <laughs> that's exciting that's yeah. that's inspiring to me yeah. You can you can enter some in the contest. We we always need more entries, and especially from North America, we never get enough entries from North America. I don't know, I don't know why. There's there's great North American biotopes, and there should be more North American people just doing biotopes. I'll do For some um, reason. It's quite Asian and Eastern European dominated. So I'll do a marsh lined with ferns, and uh, basically, I'm just going to go back with a wheelbarrow. <laughs> And scoop everything in there and then dump it into a fish tank and be like, look, this is my Do a perfectly natural. accurate one of the actual location, right? Yeah. I mean, there are people who say, I collected the sand from the actual place where the fish live. Yeah. I collected the plants from the actual place where the fish live. And then you're like, well, I can't do that because I'm not in Argentina. But it doesn't matter, you know, from wherever. And this is what people got to get out there more and see those places first hand see the beauty of those places go snorkeling in a creek or pond or wherever 
um, wherever you are. So, I mean, the places I've looked for these uh, have been in Thailand, um, Cameroon, where I did a collecting trip uh, with the group uh, a couple years back, and um, Leticia in the Amazon. And the places I would look for are obviously, the big rivers are hopeless. You can't see anything in there. But the smaller ones, you can get a GoPro in there. And if it's clear or black water and clear, you can get some good footage and some really nice and interesting scenes. And you get to see what a real wild habitat looks like, how the fish behave. And mm -hmm. very exciting for me to see some of my favorite aquarium fish in the wild, yeah. in the actual wild habitat, doing their thing and just living there. What's your favorite see, place you've oh, been to? Ick. What's that? What's the favorite place you've been to? Because you're, you're describing still, emotions that I want to hear that where that place happened. I would still happens. say Cameroon is very high up there because it was such an arduous and difficult trip. You know, the roads were terrible, but the people were really, really friendly, really nice. And the places were just amazing. There were some, just some gorgeous locations with black volcanic rock uh, in rivers and Anubias growing in huge, you know, stands of Anubias. Uh, huge areas of crinum and uh, and nymphaea, the the water, tiger lotus, and so on, and you get to see how they actually grow in the wild along a stream and how the fish behave around them, and where the different fish live. Like all the little electrical fish and mormorids are in these branches and roots under the bank where the banks undercut, and that's where you would catch them. And then all a lot of the cichlids go along the plant line along the middle and you get to see how the gravel gets strewn out and stuff and see how does actually nature scape mm. how does nature I scape i think that's what rocks, i'll do for that tank. plants and wood and everything the mormons they're a lot and of it's yeah. yeah i think that's what i'll do i think i might do one of those tanks maybe the elephant mouse maybe something yeah. pretty oh with yeah i love those fish i think they're one of my favorites but i want really. to do just them yeah nothing else yeah species only tank maybe maybe some sort of a tetra i guess just for a little more action but they're just incredibly interesting to look at. And they mm -hmm. do have, like, uh, depending on the species, they do have long, like, little noses. Hmm. And they're pretty cool. So I, I managed to catch some species I was looking for when I was in Cameroon. And I had made a little device to find them, which is a piezoelectric device. So this is just made from a little device attached to some headphones and some metal rods. And you stick those in the water and you will hear the electrical signal from them converted no. into sound yeah yeah That's so you can cool. hear like zit, 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 or <laughs> and you know that they're there because you can hear them no and so shit. you know that you can set a trap for them or whatever um to get them uh, and you know where they are so and you even could identify which species if you get good enough with it because they all sound different everyone has their own frequency their own signature what would be and, your top um, three favorite species uh, of uh, mormorids yeah. Okay, that's would be definitely Campylomormorus uh, numenius, which is the one with the really, really, really long nose. Sometimes it gets as long as the entire rest of the body. Oh, right. No. Um, and, <laughs> I and, like that. And that's, and that's not like those, uh, you know, Nathanemus Peter say the elephant noses that you see every day. That has a kind of thing on its chin, a barbell on yeah, its, its chin. Yeah, it's on the this chin. This has yeah. a super long bone snout with the mouth at the very end the terminal end oh they and eat with they, it oh yeah they eat with that because this is campylomormorus it's a different genus it's a totally different fish and a whole group of fish and they're amazing because the way they feed is they feed only on basically um bloodworms like these gnat larvae or or these like almost like mosquito larvae that live inside these holes inside of clay in the bottom of the river and those nothing can reach those insects there except the campylomormorus which is evolved to put its long curved snout right into the hole and suck those little insects out um, by the tens of thousands i guess every day those things get big some of them are get almost a meter long some of these fish and then the, the other one i love is oxymormorus bulangeri which is a long uh, it's a long, sinuous fish with a long, trumpet-like snout. Um, and they're really interesting and un unusual fish. I just tried Nothing to spell that. Like them. <laughs> I just tried to Nothing Google it. Like I, 
<laughs> had to give up. <laughs> <laughs> and then my other favorite of those, um, I actually really like the Marcusinius species. So they're, they look like an elephant nose, but they instead of having the long thing on the chin, they just have a little short thing on the chin. But they school together in a group and they need like a fast current and they look amazing. So I used to have a group of those and they, they're just amazing looking fish. And what's so cool about them is just the behavior. You get to watch them interacting and talking to each other with the electrical fields, which they have in their tails. So they'll actually go tail first toward at each other. And they're, they, and they're having a very animated conversation about something, maybe hierarchy or courtship and things like that. And these fish have big brains. Some of them have the brain sizes the same as a human. Uh, proportionately to the yeah, body. Yeah, proportion. I was going to so, say, that'd be a big head on that fish. Because <laughs> they only get like... <laughs> like a bobble you, head. You can like, see... <laughs> four to six inches. You can inches, see the bulging head. Like that. Yeah. yeah. You can see their bulging cranium where they have this extra big brain for their body size. And some of these fish, like the so-called dolphin, freshwater dolphin, they will yeah. play. They'll play with a ball. They'll balance a ball on their tail. Now, how smart are they? I don't know. But at least as smart as a cat for sure a they're freshwater able to dolphin play. from the amazon yeah. right they're like the they're actually big there's a couple, few hundred pounds those, those are african fish as well so okay not the actual freshwater dolphin but it's something they call a freshwater dolphin and it's not a dolphin at all of course oh, it's a okay. fish yeah, I see it now. Yeah. yes and it's oh, you know just like they call some of those fish them. baby whales and they are not baby whales but they have a whale like shape and these have a sort of dolphin like oh shape. i need them i have so. a new favorite fish <laughs> <laughs> they're, super yeah. cool they're they're awesome some of them get about a meter long too they would be really impressive monster fish if if anyone bothered to keep them that's the point uh you know you see them once in a while very rarely yeah i think um uh, i'd love to see some in your tanks i mean that would be amazing well, I got a tank that I'm setting up uh, now, just a 120. I had no clue what I wanted to do with it, but I thought that um, I, when talking to you, I, I'd probably get, uh, you know, ideas or interest in something. But now I want to rip everything down and do biotopes. <laughs> yeah. You <laughs> but have I, a it's, light it's, bulb it's, moment, and you're like, okay. Uh, yes, <laughs> I did it. <laughs> it's just a bad time to do it because um, of winter, and I'm not going to be able to, like, really source much, yeah. you know, especially locally, which I do a lot of. Um, and there's only so much more supplies left in the uh, in the backyard, like mountains of wood and rocks and whatnot. But yeah. so I, I'm, I'm warning think I'm you, going though. To. Once you go down this rabbit hole, the research it will eat you up because you'll start looking into like Borneo blackwaters, and you'll find such cool fish and habitats and so on. And you'll be like, mm -hmm. oh, I got to do one of those. And you'll look into, you know. Uh, and you'll look into like Lac Foi, this beautiful freshwater spring in Congo, and you're like, oh, I got to do one of those. <laughs> so yeah, just check them out. There's some nice biotopes all over the world. And if you can put together something that looks cool and the fish behave interestingly, and, and then you get to show some, like, like Cameroon has these freshwater pipe fish too, which are super cool. Uh, they have a whole set of cichlids that you don't normally see, Bonita chromis. Uh, almost nobody's ever seen them, but we were collecting them and some people are breeding them now. Uh, some people are still breeding from the fish that we collected. And some of those fish have been out of the hobby for like 25, 30 years. So it was kind of cool to catch para, uh, you know, Paranacromus. Uh, I caught a male that is now, it went into breeding and that was only pair in captivity. And now they are actually still continuing to be bred for the last a uh, few years now in Europe from that uh, from that collection. And it's not like they're rare or anything. It's just nobody goes there, you know? Nobody yeah. collects stuff there. So, um, yeah, it's, it's kind of cool. And then, you know, what I liked, though, was just seeing the unexpected every time. I, mm -hmm. You put on a mask, you go in there, and you're like, okay, I mean, I've seen a West African biotope. I know what they're supposed to look like from tanks and stuff. No way. Everyone is different. It just depends on the local geology. It could be all red volcanic rocks, and then the whole gravel is just made of volcanic rocks, which you would never expect, uh, or black rocks with sand, and then the way the plants are growing, or 
just the whole leaf litter of nothing but bamboo leaves covering the stream bottom with Anubias growing out between black volcanic rocks. You can't, you can't uh, imagine this stuff because it's nature and nature is more creative than we are actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Well, and, and it'd be similar to saying, like, all the everything under the water in Canada looks the same. Yeah, well, that's the thing, is, like, we're yeah. surrounded by all this water. There's water everywhere, and everyone sees it and knows about it, but no one thinks to take a look. And Well, some people do, but n very few people Michael think does. to take a look <laughs> inside and yep. see what's going on and what is under under there. And so yeah. it is interesting especially to fresh water. think about it. Uh, yeah, especially fresh water. Um, I'll get the in the uh, website for you when we're done here. Um, I'll link it in. The so description. yeah, exactly. You know, this is this is the neglected area, and I mean, I joined a live cast of, uh, of this fishery scientist recently. He's an expert in the saltwater fisheries and so on, and and I just asked him about what about the freshwater? You know, the the saltwater areas, the marine areas, they're in trouble. They're overfished. They're polluted and all this stuff. What about the freshwater? He said. Oh, 10 times worse, 100 times worse. We don't have data on it. Everything that we do, pollution and all these things, affects freshwater much, much faster and much more severely than the marine because the marine has a little bit of a buffer. You have a little bit of time because of the size of it. You can mm -hmm. recover yeah. things a little more easily because of the size of it. The scale is so huge. But freshwater, yeah. it's actually very small compared to the marine and you could very mm -hmm. quickly dry up a river from diverting for irrigation you could pollute and destroy an entire ri river in short time you can overfish something to extinction in a short time and yeah. so I, I, I really do feel like the fresh water anything even you're doing here with these naturalistic tanks it's bringing attention to that you know it's bringing people's awareness to the fact that this exists right well, when that, when I hear you talk about certain things, then I look at my tanks. I'm like, these all look fake and phony. <laughs> They're cool. I like them, but like, and it's my style. But you know, I'm I'm uh, I'm questioning what I want to do in the new year, and uh, maybe I haven't reinvented myself as a hobbyist in all this time. And uh, I think maybe this could be. It's interesting, but I mean, we'll see what happens. I'll sleep on it. Of course, this is a a big decision and things for me. Maybe I'll sure. dab dabble in it with a tank or two. I'm interested in um, the trips that you've taken over time. What does that entail? So you you line it up. What do you get on a plane and you land in the country you want to go to? How, did, how Walk me through, like, how does that happen? What, what goes on? Well, I mean, the one for Cameroon was just a planned, very well-planned trip, almost like a military operation. Huh? It was mostly German and Dutch uh, hobbyists, and I was the only North American there. Um, so they plan it like day by day, literally where you're going to be day by day, collecting, uh, bringing the fish back here, doing this, which species you're collecting in which areas and all of this stuff. It's all planned out in advance. The permits to be there take months. I had to, you know, be in contact with the Cameroon embassy and send all my documents had to send my, you know, actual passport to them to get the visa and all this stuff. So Cameroon was pretty involved and took a lot of planning. So a great credit to, to, to the group that managed to pull it off. But once you're there, I mean, for that kind of trip, the infrastructure of the com country is not really there, right? So you're going around dirt roads and deserted places and places where it's pretty hard to find food. It's pretty hard to find accommodation. Um, you might be as we were driving in the pouring rain in the middle of nowhere down a mud road that the truck in front of us has started sliding sideways down the hill in the torrential rain because it's so slippery and oh we're just gosh. like oh we can't start sliding now or getting stuck in the mud for hours and hours and hours and digging it out and and changing tires and running into officials that want to see all our passports again for the like hundredth time so it can be pretty <laughs> it sounds like a movie <laughs> yeah it, it's yeah. like an adventure all right but you know yeah. at, at some point you may get so exhausted you don't care about the fish anymore <laughs> you don't care about yeah. anything anymore except getting to like a hotel where you can sleep or where you can rest right so and i think yeah. that's why i don't but, want to do it because it just sounds like you need so much patience yeah. To go on a trip like oh, that, yeah. and I would yeah. I would lose it. 
Yeah. I would lose my shit yeah. in a I country mean, that it would be rough. Would be really not nice to <laughs> Take me. Take me home right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, at some points, everyone was getting pretty exhausted. Um, but at the same time, then once they get their fish back that they went there to collect, they're yeah. very happy and they forget the bad memories. <laughs> part. Yeah. And, and you'll never so, make memories like that. Yeah. So, but I mean, it was cool. You meet people in these villages. And the, the thing was, we had done the stuff so much on the fly and had so little time that not all of these villages had been contacted ahead of time. So we would sometimes arrive somewhere and the local people would come and say, who are you guys? And they're speaking in French. A few people know English, but they're, they're like, who are you people? This is our river here. What are you doing here? And then you have to ta contact the local chief of the village and work things out. And that was usually done with massive amounts of cases and cases of beer. <laughs> and that was the way to communicate was with yeah, cases would, and cases of beer. Once everyone you. had a beer in their <laughs> hand, everyone's happy and people will calm down and everything's okay. But you until that happens, we it could be a along. little tense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we had a case where a woman pulled up in a Cadillac dressed to the nines. And she said, excuse me, in perfect English, which it's, it's French there, but she speaks perfect English. I'm the governor of this state, and I wasn't informed that you were coming here. <laughs> and she just gave us a lecture, oh and goodness. everything was okay. We talked with her and so on, but she, you know, had been called by the locals and, and probably by the local cops and stuff. That Look, there's some people doing stuff here we didn't know about. And so they actually called their local governor, and she showed up. And Well, how many, and how many people is going on this trip, and how many fish are you collecting? There were about 10 people. There were about 10 people on this trip, which for me is a little too many because then you have to end up splitting up. Logistics can become very difficult. You have to have two SUVs that are four wheel drive because you are not getting through a lot of those places without that, mm -hmm. uh, without the four wheel drive. Yeah. And then we had a guide as well, and he was great. He knew all the local spots and the best spots for different fish and different biotopes and so on. And it was just amazing. It was great to see these schools of beautiful iridescent blue lampis, hundreds of them in the stream and you can see the cichlids spawning and not spawning but care taking their babies around in their mouths and taking mm -hmm. care of them you know and um how they how they live like how they how they actually are and then you also see the destruction you see rivers that are getting destroyed by local pollution or farming or irrigation has run off that has put a lot of you know um chemicals agricultural chemicals into the water and then you have algae bloom and the whole thing is just covered with algae all the plants all the beautiful scenery is gone because everything is completely overgrown with algae so all of these things are happening but i mean better that we show them and see them and know that you know and a lot of these fish too they only occur in one little river or one little stream or one little area and if they disappear if that thing gets polluted or bulldozed or whatever they're gone mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they're completely gone and nobody it's like almost nobody except the aquarists ever knew they were there and if somebody yeah. didn't have them and wasn't breeding them they're gone like that's it it's not like there's a special program to keep them in production from you know uh wwf or something like that there it's not like that right i remember when wwf used to mean the wrestling federation <laughs> well, Hulk, Hogan and Hulk Hogan and Ultimate Warrior and you know those those guys Hacksaw Jim Duggan they were in WWF and then all of a sudden they had to change it to WW I don't know what else yeah, what it is now, now e that's the World Wildlife Federation yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, used I to remember see the commercials I stopped watching I stopped Wildlife watching when Federation. they changed it to that what uh, so with everything so planned out and you're there to collect something specifically or see something specifically, what if you change your mind or you see something else you would rather do too bad? Well, I mean, I got in trouble a lot because I would, they'd be like, okay, uh, only these people go in the stream. And I'm like, nah, screw that. I'm going to go in the stream. And I would just go in against so-called orders. And I didn't really understand that there's a kind of etiquette in these groups, especially the European groups. You must follow the leader Absolutely. You can't not for anything, even the time and what you're going to eat and all that stuff is very planned out. And for me as a North American, I'm just not that, uh, you know, I can't easily go along with that, to be honest. So I did get in trouble quite a few times for just doing 
going off in a different direction or things like that. But yeah, if they want to split, the group can talk about it and say, okay, this group would like to go collect kili fish, which are totally found in different places than the rest of the fish because they're found in puddles and stuff in the forest and little ponds and not in the main rivers or streams at all. They don't like those big streams because it's too many predators and they, and it's too much competition and things like that. So they're in those little ponds, isolated ponds, where it can be even like one species per pond, right? Or a special mm. locality. And those, so the killy people would kind of separate off and then the cichlid people would go over here. And oh, so you would yeah. get splitting for a day or two to different which, places. Uh, which group of people, and you're gonna have to throw them under the bus here, which, is the, which group is the most annoying because they think they're elite? or just annoying <laughs> you mean in terms of the fish in terms of like getting along with them because <laughs> yeah but like, i mean in terms of like the uh, from which countries or cultures oh no or not from the countries which, uh, the, what they're the, looking the for fish. for the fish yeah the fish i mean i have to say uh killy fish people can be pretty annoying <laughs> just <laughs> because they're very exclusive about what they do yeah. and they keep a very tight-knit group mm -hmm. it just depends though there's good killy fish people and there's bad killy fish people but sometimes like the clubs too they can be very very exclusionary and elitist and like if you don't know this and that location and where all the the numbers associated with each one in the code then then you're not a real killy fish hobbyist anyway and and to hell with you, basically. Yeah, that's, so, that's but, and then wide, cichlid people can be pretty hard nosed as well. So can L number people. It just depends. Mm -hmm. There's a few communities that are they're pretty exclusive about their fish, and they they are, and their knowledge, their specialized knowledge about their fish. Yeah. So yeah, you get little snobby little clicks. Any, uh, I just got let back into a group <laughs> that I was banned from for the longest time. Um, probably partly to do with stuff from that trip. <laughs> so I just got let back in after the longest time. I think they'd had a sort of North American purge and kicked all the North Americans out of that group. What? Um, and but I was one of But now that you're talking about it, you're back out. <laughs> I might be kicked out tomorrow for this. Um, no, but they won't. fortunately, I'll, I don't I'm, think they I'm, watched this, I'm so I think kidding. we're okay. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, I mean, there's there are clicky little groups and then you get clicky groups of other types of aquarists too mm -hmm. certain plant people for sure certain aquascape it's throughout the people. whole hobby there's always, there's always going to be kind of, type yeah, of there's always going to be those but on the internet you could just leave like oh yeah. x yeah. leave whatever but when you're in person yeah. on a in different. a truck or staying in the same place or staying on the same boat and you're yeah. doing all the same yep. stuff and you have to deal with these people i'd have maybe two three hours in me <laughs> Before, like, I'm going to lose it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, so I definitely had a few arguments, and I was that guy going with the guide. Like, the guide's like, hey, you want to see some local food in the village here? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. And they're like, no, the boss <laughs> said not to, the leader said. And I'm like, eh, it'll be all right. And I'll just go off, run off with the guide. And he'd show me some place with, like, a dirt floor, and we're having Cameroon stew. And I don't know what's in it, but it's good. And... <laughs> I would just run off and do stuff like that. That's what but I would want to do. I would want to enjoy yeah, everything. Yeah. And it's your there, money. Right? Are you, are you yeah. the one paying? Yeah. Now, why, why can't you uh, vary I, from the plan? Is it dangerous or something? Like, is there something they're mm, wor really worried about? Or is no, this more of a control thing? it's a cultural thing? thing to do with hierarchy. Oh, okay. That it's disrespectful to disobey the leader, basically. So what happens? Like, what's the worst thing that happens to you if you continue to be bad? Like, he gets removed you from his friends. You are ostracized from the <laughs> yeah, group. Yeah, he has no you're not allowed to have any you friends anymore. And do they send you home or like they just take off without you and leave you well, in you the middle of nowhere? You can't do that because it's Cameroon, right? Yeah. But there's always the looming threat that it could happen. But no, <laughs> they can't actually, you can't actually do that. We had some good times. We had a few beers and things like that as well. And, you know, we had good times there, definitely. But there were a few tense moments as well. And they had to do with cultural, cultural differences in, in autonomy, mostly. And, mm. and things like that. Whereas, whereas the Germans and, and Dutch were very, very much on board and that is culturally appropriate. You know, my background's anthropology, so I get it. Like it's culturally appropriate to follow the leader and he's organized everything to, and he's responsible for everyone and keeping them safe yeah. and what they eat and everything. And also his reputation about the yeah. whole thing too. So I get that and it actually makes sense. I was actually the one in the wrong uh, as much as I like to say, well, this and that. 
but I was the North American with the North American culture thing yeah. that didn't fit with the rest of the group, right? So that was my bad in, in a lot of ways, actually. And I, I was very aware of that, you know. I would do it so, in any way, yeah, as, I mean, as I know it would be disrespectful, and I did, I, that would not be my intentions. Yeah. But I can't yeah. be expected to absorb your culture in the back seat of this four wheel drive truck. I'm not going to learn it all at once. Yeah. And I will do yeah. impulsive things and I will do things that, you know, you might not agree with, but, and I'm not coming yeah. from a hateful or hurtful place, of course, but yeah. man, I would have loved to go eat at that dirt floored place too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had to, I'm like, I'm here in Cameroon. I didn't even know if I'm ever going to be in Cameroon again in my life. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to see yeah. like some places and mm -hmm. talk to some people and see what is the real local life like. Mm. And, um, it was amazing. It was really cool. Yeah. Um, and I would love to go back someday. And those Absolutely. will be your best stories anyway. When yeah. you went off the beaten path, when you didn't listen to everybody, when mm -hmm. those will be your, the funnest stories that you have. And experiences. Yeah, yeah for sure. What's for the most sure. danger you've actually been in, whether it's been in the water and the current's taken you away or there's a predator or, you know, um, gorilla type warriors or anything like, is there anything like that? Has those actually... weren't actually in those places. I have to say those were in other countries like um, those were in places from from animals. Uh, I would still say when I went to Zambia and I did a little river safari there and there were hippos you oh, know, yeah. at eye level. That was kind of dangerous, I have to say, because if you're taking a tiny little canoe over hippos yeah. and they happen to surface and they don't I like you, chills. They'll bite it in half. they will yeah, bite like... you in half. And they, yeah. they're right there. So they're like, the guides are like, okay, we have to slow down here. There's a hippo ahead. Either it's going to get out of the river and run away, which some of them did, or it's going to dive under and we have to quickly take the boat over top, over mm. the hippos and hope that they don't like surface next to us. And one of them did surface next to us and just let out like real loud, like letting the water out of the nose oh, thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, we jumped a mile. We jumped a mile because... It was just showing its presence, but they don't like competition in their territory. And there oh, were crocodiles not. around there too, but we weren't worried about the crocodiles. We were only worried if the hippo capsizes the boat, then you have to worry about the crocodiles because there are some pretty big crocodiles in that river as well. So, Do you have guns, anything um, like that to protect you guys? Like what's the, that? Does oh, the yeah, guide have like a hunting stuff, but, rifles or know, something? You know, I don't know if a gun is going to stop a giant hippo. Yeah. Not in time. It'll stop it after it's bitten you in half, and then it'll be like <laughs> a little bit too late. <laughs> so, yeah. And I mean, the other times I've been on safari with elephants, and definitely elephants make you feel your life pass before your eyes <laughs> because elephants are they're the bosses wherever they are yeah and when an elephant starts showing its ears and blocking the road <laughs> well you just back up I'm so until you are right out now. of sight yeah, you have no choice yeah, yeah so huh. those are the from animals that's the most i mean in cameroon there's not really a lot of wildlife to be honest left like there's there are actually gorillas and stuff in the more remote areas mm -hmm. and chimpanzees um but there's not a lot of things like lions or anything like that um the other thing is, uh, I mean, lions and so on, the big animals, the big predators, those are the ones that really, you know. Um, and then other than that, though, uh, I never felt at all in danger in Cameroon. I have to say, like, the roads were dangerous, some areas, uh, you know, there are bad accidents and so on. But I never felt threatened by anyone there. People, people were really nice. Um, even when people were approaching and we didn't know them and so on, uh, they still seemed nice. But that's because we stayed away from certain areas, especially border areas. So there are border areas you definitely, you absolutely can't go in Cameroon. They won't even so, let you go there. If somebody's trying to get into biotopes, what would you, how would they go about doing it in the current state of what they have? Like they just have access to their local fish store or... You know, not tons of, uh, not a huge budget. Um, yep. Is there like an, the, the best sized aquarium they should start with? Like maybe it should be taller or shorter. What What are some things that you could you could tell somebody right now that could ease them into it? So or I mean, you, is I there love a better the idea with starting with smaller ones? Smaller ones are easy to do for at the get go, and you can do a great little beta biotope 
so easily. A little mm -hmm. beta black water. Right. Uh, you can do something for neon tetras or cardinals, super easy, a small one, like especially black waters. But I mean, I'll give you guys the website for the contest at the end. It's a great source of inspiration mm -hmm. uh, for all sizes of biotopes. And then they can kind of browse through there and find some of the easier ones. There's loads of commonly available fish that you yeah. can make a simple biotope for. Um, so the beta biotopes, super easy. They don't even necessarily have to have a lot of circulation. They can be quite small, have okay. some grass like plants coming out the top. Yeah. black water with some nice leaves in it mm -hmm. and if you can get it one or two of these nice wild caught um and wild types of betas right and that's a real that's a desktop one you can do mm -hmm. it's super easy yeah and then Accessible little things for cardinals and and um hatchet fish and things like that with a few branches leaves and uh, making a black water super easy to do yeah and um, besides those, there's there's lots of other easy ones, uh, Asian ones. I also love my, you know, favorite ones are the West African. Mm -hmm. um, do some small, nice planted one with killifish uh, or with small West African cichlids, like the beautiful pelvic acromus species, uh, which you can find... Um, pretty easily i mean there there there's only a few places that have all the different species but that's an easy one to do with a few nice tetras and so on and you can have plants in those and that could be you know like a just a 200 liter or something it doesn't have to be huge it's yeah. an easy one to do so but yeah cool. i love the idea of desktop beta biotopes some of those yeah. look really beautiful and it acts as a kind of almost like nice little display you could even have a little flowering grass or something in there mm. um so it's more like a little paludarium. Um, those are great ones to start. But I'll give you the website and then people can browse through the hundreds and hundreds of videos and photos of actual entries of biotope tanks and look and see what things they like. Get inspired by something yeah. and definitely look and see look, that those a lot of those contain the most common fish that you can get. But they've just focused on where do those fish come from? What does that place look like? And uh, some of them are very easy to do like dead easy to do start with a little black water or something like that or a little paludarium with grass coming out the top and then you you're hooked you know then you can attempt something a little more ambitious and we've had people do that over the years we have a mexican biologist victor um ortiz who he's done them for his classroom and he just started you know tinkering around taking some local small cool looking fish and bog plants and aquatic plants and setting up with the rocks and everything make it look like a stream and over the years he's done better and better and bigger and bigger ones um, and then that can seg into doing bigger ones with like uh, with uh, some of the nice uh, Mexican cichlids um, the Tarikthi species and so on um, they, those can go abs absolutely to huge sizes with wild sword tails and all kinds of cool things in them and, and rock scapes and even a lot of those have a lot of plants in them too like the Lacondon jungle areas in Chiapas yeah. beautiful beautiful spring fed lakes there's all the cenotes in Mexico so once you go down the rabbit hole you're like oh what are Mexican biotopes and that's a whole world there's been an actual book published on Mexican biotopes mm -hmm. a few years back absolutely gorgeous aquascapes and you look into anywhere and you'll start to find, yeah, it is rare to find the clear water ones, but when you find them, some of them are absolutely amazing and would gr make a great tank. Well, yeah. like the botanical so type the aquariums. Yeah. yeah, that'll be fine. Just, I'll put it in the description yeah. for everybody. Like botanical sure. type um, aquariums with the with tannins and stuff, those have become more prevalent over the last probably like three or four years, maybe two yeah. or three, yep. where they're becoming more and more and more popular. Um, yep. So I can see, and that is one foot in the door. It uh, is actually, towards. and that's like where, where we're starting to get more specific interests where now you have like a whole group of rift hobbyists who keep Tanganyikans and so on, and they're really into their biotopes, which are extremely specific, the splash zone ones or the deep water ones or certain localities. And, and then you have, yeah, these, this whole black water scene and tannin scene, and there's now companies and websites and so on and everything associated with that and that's you know a, your choice if you want to make it a biotope or not but you you can easily 
you, there's there's fantastic biotope uh, black waters in in uh, the Congo. These red waters, with these absolutely gorgeous jewel like um, tetras in them, and then you have an amazing unusual plants with purple sheen on them, and then you've got all the great Southeast Asian peat bog black waters, and then you have of course the Amazon uh, black waters. But that one I visited was fantastic. It was like the banks were made of layers of stacked leaves and um, there were, you know, ember tetras in among the plants along the side and all kinds of cool, interesting things. So yeah, Blackwater's whole area in itself actually. Um, and, and I think the kind of somber and a little bit moody look of it is now becoming almost a little bit fashionable in mm. some circles. Well, then there's the world of recreating the water movement. Um, I seen one thing. Did you ever go to like a water park and there's the big bucket that fills with water and then it dumps over yeah. and then it just all splashes? Some I've seen um, some of those concepts where they are recreating like waterfalls that okay. work yep. on that type of thing and, and purge type systems and that uh, dump a massive amount of water all at once or... You know, then there's hill yep. stream tanks and stream tanks and river type styles. And those types of aquariums are also incredibly interesting. But within a within a box, it's very difficult to keep everything actually looking half decent mm -hmm. with yep. that much water volume. Yeah. But when you get into those tanks, they do have a lot of water flow. Um, some of them, yeah. of course, especially the fast flowing uh, rivers and streams. Uh, and I've seen some of them, but most of them are just hardscaped. Not a lot, yep. obviously not a lot of plants can survive in those conditions, but that's interesting as well, because once you get into those biotopes, you know, you, then you're, then you got to look at wanting, like you said, creating the lighting, um, yep. and creating, uh, th but the water flow would be interesting to me and like all those yeah. tiny little projects that I'd be able to make. Yeah. Cause that's so interesting these, to me. That whole area is one of my favorite types of biotope, and especially if it's being done well. Um, there's a shop in Hanover called Panta Ray and they, uh, yeah made a few um, displays and they did actually one tilted tank which was a white water with rocks mm -hmm. and the water flowing over it at high speed and they use a special uh, pump that they made called a hydro wizard yeah. which has real really high output so then they put all these L numbers and different uh, fast water fish in there and they did great and it looks amazing um, and it could be better but it it's the idea of actually doing that. And there's been a few where they basically that make tank. a scaffold. The water comes yeah. down underneath and then it just flows in one direction down yeah. the tank. I think it has like a false speed. wall or something that collects the water. Yeah. It opens up all these cool fish you can keep and their behavior in a fast water environment, which is different, you know. And then they also, there's this concept of wave makers for Tanganyika yeah. tanks for the wave zone. So the water actually pours in from the top and you get bubbles and a whole wave effect of all the fish moving back and forth in a in a actual surge. Um, reef people have done that stuff for a long time, but it belongs in freshwater too. And some of the coolest looking uh, biotopes for uh, like Congo, for example, are these river ones. All these streamlined river cichlids uh, that live in only in those habitats and gobies and um, all kinds of um, uh, tetras and various things that are adapted for these fast water uh, environments. And I think those look fantastic. They're very challenging to do, but wow, it's so dynamic and interesting to look at, isn't it? So, yeah. So are we looking to also not only replicate the fish and the plants and the, and the actual appearance, but uh, water flow and direction yes. and lighting but also yep. are we also do we care about parameters of the water yes all of those things like I mean, that's everything everything yes okay everything you can you that can do yeah. to me there should even be an above water component in a lot of these mm -hmm. a lot of these will work better as a paludarium than they would as just an aquarium because what you see in the wild is there's this interaction with branches hanging over or plants that are marginal plants growing out of the side. And that's part of the habitat in yeah. most cases. Mm -hmm. So that's what's missing from a lot of aquariums is that whole marginal side. And that's where a lot of interaction happens with fish. It's where the fry hide. It's where a lot of uh, prey items hide and um, maybe spawning may occur for some species. And if you can give something like a little bit of a river bank too in some of these tanks, the fish respond to that and they use that habitat 
um, for very specific things. And it also just adds so much to the realism because that's what you see when you go in a stream and so on. You see, you see the expanse a bit, but you also you see the bank and you see the roots from trees growing right down in among the rocks and all these fish that live in among the roots and so on and feel secure that way, right? And then once fish feel secure in their habitat, then you get to see all the cool things that they do. Yeah, and the reason why we like them in the first place, but we rarely get to see it yeah. in captivity because yeah. a lot of times we're just simply not keeping them. What, what a lot of hobbyists do is uh, everything's about aesthetics. Yeah. Do yep. I like the look of this tank and I think this would look cool versus does the fish that I'm keeping actually require this? Yeah. Um, or and, even yeah. like that. And I see a lot of that in the comments in my, uh, in some of my videos. Not yeah. as much anymore because I've addressed it a number of times lately. But um, well, people will be like, some people that have never even kept that fish or even seen it in person in their life will be like, it doesn't, it needs this, that, and the other thing. Um, and that's frustrating for me because, mm -hmm. like, no, it doesn't need a lot of that. Uh, a big one you get yeah. all the time or used to get was like, why don't you have substrate with the stingrays? Well, you've seen why. Exactly. It causes more problems than it's worth. I exactly. mean, they've uh, clearly evolved over 150 million years to be flat yeah. uh, and to utilize the substrate and to burrow in it and dig through it. But a happy stingray doesn't technically need it. Yeah. And if you have only one stingray, I would suggest probably a substrate. But when you have three, they already find security within each other. Yeah. Um, and, you, yeah. and, you know, maybe at some point I'll scape the 700 so that, you know, it's more. I <laughs> but what is ideal for a stingray? Mm -hmm. Just wood. Well, I guess you could scape it. Yeah, it would look something like that one that I just did that nobody's seen yet. Yeah. So do, where, like, where biotopes become problematic, maybe sometimes is with the big monster fish. Because yeah. in terms of practical things like keeping the water clean and so on, unless you have a public aquarium, that can be very challenging with a lot of these larger species. So I do see the utility of having a bare bottom tanks and things yeah. like that in a lot of cases. Because that's just a case where... You know, you need a massive tank if you're going to have sand in there and stuff like that. Yeah. You need a massive biofilter and so on, which most people can, just can't have. Yeah. So, yeah, it can kind of break down in those areas, definitely. But, yeah, I mean, this is the whole point, like, and what you're saying, too, about the social aspect, too. Fish socialize, and they have social lives. A lot of them, uh, a lot of people don't know that. They just... They, they do the kid in the candy store thing. They go in the shop and they say, I want this one, I want this one, and one of these, and one of these. And then I it takes that. a while to uh, start understanding how fish live, how they interact, and that they have a life. Yeah. They have a whole existence um, where they socialize, they have groups, they have fights, they have a lot of things, you know. Um, that's what makes them so interesting. Um, but just having a hodgepodge of fish that it's not enough to form a school and they're just kind of milling around uh, it's nothing that they recognize they're extremely brightly lit etc mm -hmm. yeah you're not going to see the natural behavior you're going to see stressed behavior yeah yeah absolutely and uh and yeah, they, they just don't color up the problem a lot of people probably don't even recognize that what fish out here do you think are wild caught what do you know michael that i have that's wild caught for sure um i could just off sure. top of your head I mean, the archer fish are. Yeah. Those are wild caught. Yeah. Those are wild caught. Yeah. Um, and then there's a whole set of fish that just don't get bred in captivity almost at all. But le let's see. I mean, Oscars are obviously captive bred almost yeah. always. There are wild caught Oscars of a few different species, but there's a mix of Oscars there's a mix of wild caught. All, all the all the epistles are, are wild caught. Um, well, and the thing is, yeah. is like when somebody does chastise me. Or I hear them chastising somebody else for wild caught, and if I have the opportunity to see their tank, what I want to, what all I'm looking for is like there's lots Something of fish in the hobby know. that's incredibly common that is not being bred in captivity in numbers yep. to sustain it just yet. Yeah. So odds are you are you have wild caught fish, you just don't know it. Yeah. But they are yeah, attached themselves right. to an emotional, you know, um, it, it's like their virtue, virtue signaling, signaling over fish. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like it, that's exactly that, that's what that wrong. is. And, yeah. 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 And this is the point. Like, wild cut doesn't mean automatically bad. The world is a mm -hmm. complicated place, and mm -hmm. it, it doesn't automatically mean bad. Uh, I mean, another. Like, it's not like I'm taking outlier. a gorilla out of the wild, or a tiger, or a yeah. lion out of the wild, and then I chain it up in my backyard. Yeah. 
I yeah, would and love I mean, to this do is something, that. <laughs> this is something Mark clued me into, which was uh, which was Attenborough's statement about aquariums, which is that, you know, he's a great conservationist, and he's so pro aquarium mm -hmm. because public and private aquariums because it's an educational tool. Yeah. It lets people reconnect with nature. It lets people understand something more. And as he mentioned, uh, there are a number of fish that some fish may be happier and more content in a nice aquarium than in the wild because man, life is tough out there. There are yeah. fish that are pretty much seasonal because everything dries up and most of them die or yeah. suffocate or get eaten every year. And um, they actually have longer lifespans in captivity. They're not constantly threatened with death. You know, it's hard for us to judge from the fish's point of view. Is it happier? in a uh, constant danger or is it ha i mean is it happier in a nice uh aquarium i don't know honestly well i, I think know. that w when there's so many there's so many arguments to be had about it but mm -hmm. I, I i see way more benefits in um responsibly collecting yeah. and keeping wild yeah. fish as opposed to not at all yeah. um i also see most conservation efforts are started by somebody that was a hobbyist at one point mm -hmm. they yep. were inspired they fell in love they wanted to do something more yeah um but in order to in order to even bring awareness or to have somebody else actually care a lot of the times it's great that they start off with a fish tank yeah so they can care as well yeah 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 so i mean this is one thing that nds is really trying to do is now we're actually partnering with some freshwater conservation organizations, especially Shoal, which they're showing the most initiative um, to actually do worldwide conservation efforts for freshwater fish. Um, and they, their members have done, you know, things like uh, conservation for the Mekong giant catfish and, and things like that worldwide. And they're actually looking, you know, we, we are hoping to do exhibits to do biotopes and various things that will help to promote their cause and help to get more attention from potential donors and, and people who can do something about this. So, mm -hmm. you know, that we're not just being passive in the hobby here. We're actually actively being involved and having some kind of focus for people who care to actually do something about this, to get the get word out there um, I mean, I'm hoping at some point we might do some biotopes of actual endangered um, habitats where people are doing projects and just help to publicize those things, help to get attention out there uh, from the general public as well um, as other organizations and so on, and just see if I've, see I've had um, bad experiences. All my experiences with trying to get involved with that have always been negative. Uh, Mark yeah, mentioned I mean, the other day. I didn't want to bring it up. And, been and, and, in the past too. So this is why we're being very selective and careful about who we're talking to and yeah. what they're actually doing. Um, because, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of talk about these things. And then there's a lot of self-promotion or misguided attempts or things that just aren't going to go anywhere or where where they backlash on you like, oh, aquarium industry is bad, so we can't do that. and various things like that right yeah. so we're we're careful to sort of clear the air with who we're talking to that yeah. you know are you for example public aquarium friendly because we feel that's a very important part of conservation and yeah. um we are you know partnering with groups like shoal that are also pro science pro public aquarium there's a big difference to me between animal rights and animal welfare you know mm -hmm. uh animal rights can go very far in saying things like no, no animals should be captive. Whereas animal welfare yeah. is the idea of making sure that animals that we keep are sustainably collected, that they're properly kept, that there are laws that protect mm -hmm. them and all that. That's a different matter uh, to yeah. me. And also sure. that, that they've got to be pro science and, and that there are positive aspects in the aquarium industry. If we do this the right way, there are good there are good social effects there are good conservation efforts that can be done but people have to get involved on a higher level and how do we do that more you know more influential people in an organization need to get involved too and not be falling for those 
agendas of virtue signaling and all of that stuff. Well, that's what right? happens to me that's every time that I'm approached in any way. All it is is like they just see me as a billboard. I'm yeah. like, so where yeah. does this money go? What are we going to do? What is my yeah. actual involvement besides saying exactly. your name? These that's are all. The, and, and then they ghost we're me. Asking at I'm like, I just want to know what you're no actually question. doing. That's it. Yeah. I just want to know what you're doing. What you, and what are your intentions? I have, I have, I would love to, I've already brought a massive amount of awareness to a ton of different topics and, and, yeah. and things. But when you don't want to tell me anything, um, yeah. or, you know, give me a spreadsheet of where this will go or that will go. Yeah. Um, you know, I donated large sums of money over the years, uh, especially like two, three years ago. And I never heard from them again. I didn't know where the money went. And I'm not talking 500 bucks. Um, yep. I think it was like in the year 2018, I gave away to different conservations. Um, and I believe it's some of their biggest donations they've ever received. And I did it not anonymously, but I just didn't want any advertisement about it. I didn't need anything yep. in return, but it's almost like they they uh, honey potted me or whatever that's called where they, they tricked me. And um, they exist to like, this day. See you later, and there's no connection to the aquarium hobby. There's no connection to anything. I just didn't. Uh, they still exist to this day, um, yep. and people still talk. And maybe I, sh you know what? It's, it is what it is. But I, it, that's why I sometimes I'm a little standoffish um, sure. about what I'm actually talking about or who I'm talking about because, yep. man, I don't know where that money went. Yeah. Did they? Yep. Well, obviously it went to them, but yeah. what? What? what did they use it for? What did they do with it? Yeah. yeah so, so, I mean, this is the thing. Those organizations should be perfectly transparent about what they're doing with the money and what it's, yeah. how it's helping, not just vague ideas like, well, we're helping the local people, et cetera, et cetera. How? How are you actually doing? Could I go on a trip there and see what you're actually doing on the ground and see mm -hmm. what the actual effects are? Uh, have people heard of you guys? Is it is it making a big influence and so on? So this yeah. is, I mean, initially, this is part of the reason that I was so uh, drawn to what Mark was doing was, you know, Mark's started doing, you know, na nature design studio and doing aquascapes and so on. But he had this interest in biotopes. And that's how we started talking was because he had gone in an expedition and he would talked about it. So I just contacted him and I was like, hey, you know, do you want to try to do something to do with biotopes and uh, freshwater conservation at some point helping to promote self uh, helping to promote freshwater conservation some way and he's like yeah that's what so he's all can, about basically so what's this a is safe what, why what's I'm, a safe you know, um i we're, we talked in circles a lot but i wanted to like get get this is a thing i'm passionate about like so how sure. can we actually help who do we who do we get in contact with which conservation um and how do we actually do something apart from if somebody doesn't have 20 bucks to give them what else can we do um, obviously awareness is, is helpful, but is, is, is there anything specific like that, that the average people can put into yeah, place? average persons that, that can actually make a change because I can talk about it all I want and raise money. So here's what I did. I talked to yep. this one, uh, one place and I, it was a tax write off anyway. So I cared, but I didn't care. Like I didn't get that mad, but I asked them what they uh, made in donations the year prior and I matched it so they wouldn't have to work so hard the following year to make any money. I, I gave them everything they made and it was a lot of money in retrospect because yep. I don't make yep. that anymore, but I was making a lot of money before. Um, and uh, I didn't know what it was going to be used for. Um, yep. They gave me general ideas how to continue operations. We'll build another hut and da, 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 and a few little things, but none of that ended up happening. As far as I know, they never updated me. Nothing. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was like, well, you know, fooled me once. Mm. And uh, yes. so who's safe, in your opinion, to to uh, promote and or... I, I want to consult with Mark on this for a minute. Would you say Shoal is a good bet for this? Because they look good to me. So, uh, yeah, I, I want to say Shoal. Uh, uh, obviously, I work with uh, Dr. Anthony Mazzaro, uh, the Amazon Research Center. And I know that he is trying his personal best to make things happen. It's just that uh, obviously he's a one man, not a one man team but per se, but he has very limited manpower and resource. And he's, you know, like a lot, uh, here's the thing about like a lot of these uh, organizations is that uh, the founders of these organizations are not necessarily business people, right? And yeah. they're oftentimes not business people. So 
in order to run a very successful organization, whether it being a non-profitable or not, you're actually running a business. That's right. So more to corporate structure. be able to run a successful business and operation, you cannot just have one man team or like a small team. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You need a well-funded backing that actually gather professional people from an array of uh, professional, uh, sk- uh, like ha- have the professional skills to be able to actually make some type of like really powerful and meaningful impact. Yeah. So in this way, yeah, I agree with that. In this way, I feel like Show has a well-funded backer, and they're actually carry a lot of professional experience from NetGeo, you know, or not NetGeo, WWF, uh, to uh, you know down the line to uh, other affiliations of uh, you know net, uh, conservations. So yeah. they are probably I, I want to say the yeah one of the best yeah. for um, net, uh, freshwater conservation. Yeah. So we'll, we'll I'll give you the link for the Shoal site S H O A L. We've been meeting with them, corresponding with them, and they are on the ball. As far as I can tell, their goals are, you know, they're scientifically aligned, and they are not anti-aquarium. They're not anti anything in particular, and they have the experience with actual very high-profile donors and involvement in the past to actually maybe make a difference. So mm-hmm. what I would say is to look at these organizations, and I mean, there are small things you can do. I mean, my personal feeling is make biotope aquariums and enter them in contests and highlight the conservation features of those. I feel like that personally is a one way to, to get awareness out there more if you want to highlight a a particular tank, but that's a small way ultimately. So the idea with Shoal is they're actually starting to coordinate and get all these freshwater organizations around the world to cooperate in a coordinated way and take it seriously in terms Mm -hmm. of funding uh, achievable goals and what is the end goal for that rather than than more vague ideas or very local grassroots things that don't connect to larger movements, right? So they're the sort of first people really doing this is Shoal. They're the first ones to actually attempt are they, this. Are they interested in getting actual hobbyists involved at least yes, a certain definitely. Some extent? They're very interested in that. They're very so, interested in that. So they're not shunning it at all. Yeah. Yeah. I've never heard so of this them. This is the point. And at one this point I had point. the biggest voice in the hobby and I've never heard of them. And they never contact me or anything like that. And I'm not feeling entitled or anything. I just felt like, man, I got a pretty big voice. You should probably talk to the, and maybe bounce ideas off of, of how to get yeah. people to care about something. Yeah. And these types That's of right. conversations at times frustrate me because people are like, um, some people want me to do more and more and more. And a lot of people don't know what I've already done because I don't brag about yep. stuff. But, um, you know, I think it would be beneficial for, for Shoal especially to to set up a conference call with a number of people and bounce ideas off of how to get people to actually care. Yeah. Um, you know, I think checking out the websites, obviously step one, Mm -hmm. um, see what they actually do and Mm -hmm. see if there's any room in there to care about. But you know, when there comes to biotope contests, maybe it's for them, uh, as well. Maybe they run one where, you know, um, maybe they want people to do a contest that, uh, is on a highly threatened area. Mm-hmm. Yep, and uh, you know because if we just talk about it and one person does it, it doesn't seem like a lot. But if you get a hundred people or thousand people yeah. or ten thousand people to all do the same thing, it brings yeah. a lot of awareness. Yeah, yes. you know. And, so this um, is the point. We want to get all of this, you know, integrated. Um, the hobby, the contests, yeah. the conservation, so that there's active sort of reciprocal promotion and so on, and that this can actually get out there. Mm-hmm. get more popularized get more known yeah and and not be have these exclusionary sort of um virtue signaling uh stances that you know that happen like oh, that's that's a lot of what i've seen bad yeah. And yeah any of that stuff look a lot of aquarists care and want to do something but they don't know what to do and there's lots of sort of red herrings out there for this kind of stuff well that's where that's why i was frustrated just a minute and i apologize not like i'm attacking you it's just more of me uh you know trying to voice my frustrations and like this isn't anything new for me in in terms of uh, conservation or trying to help out different organizations or anything like that it's just 
Yep. For the average person, they would feel helpless. Like, what can I do? Give you 20 bucks, yeah. 50 bucks? I can't afford that. I, I don't have that yeah, exactly. to give you. What else can I do? Is there anything yeah. else? Is there anything? And, and there's little to no literature or any sort of resources to actually yep. find out how the average person can have an impact. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. So this is the issue. I mean, and these these guys are interested in basically, you know, through the hobby and through a lot of other methods and even through zoos and aquariums and so on, getting this word out there and starting to reach influential people and so on who did that you can actually influence government policy. You can actually influence an area, a dam being built or not being built, a, a mm-hmm. area being conserved or not captive breeding programs that are coordinated why not have captive breeding coordinators uh, you know coordinated with hobbyists who are a lot of them are real experts in that stuff why not start to integrate some of those things and see that's what, what i'm can saying really yeah. be done like um let's um let's do it for to- a second yeah. <laughs> sure. can i pop in for a second yeah go ahead yeah, yeah like I, we shared that same exact frustration i mean me and michael we uh, try to we we tried to figure out Project Piaba for hours, right? Like we we spoke to them. I mean, like we were trying to find out about like how like what the actual you know um, uh, work they're actually doing. We want to contribute. Like I've been trying to you know like trying to see how, uh, like is there any way we can contribute, but the transparency is just simply not there and. Well, that's you know, a like, good good one to talk about because if you do talk oh, to them, man. it is well, you can promote us and give us money. I'm like, well, that's cool and stuff, but like, why? What What are you gonna do? Yeah, uh, what happens next? Doing What's the, the next step? Yeah, what happens after that? Mm-hmm. And um, you know, I, I just I think that somebody needs to realize that the aquarium hobby has millions upon millions of people within it. Yeah, literally yeah. millions and millions and millions. Why are we not? Yeah focused on uh, the that, largest you know, demographic we, of the thing that we're trying to care about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Right. And then especially that when we're talking about like freshwater conservation, I mean, they're the like probably the biggest name out there, right? Like whenever people bring, bring it up, it's like, okay, Project Piaba. Okay, yeah, we love to, you know, like we love their model. We love, uh, you know, like- Well, yeah, you know, and, and we probably pre- preface this with, this is just based off two people's experiences. They might not be bad or anything and i'm not going to try to bash oh, them no, or anything yeah, and sure. you know do your own research and form your own opinion uh this isn't the end all of uh the, of, of that organization and they probably do way more good than than we think but you know just off personal experiences mine wasn't the greatest and mm-hmm. i just washed my hands of it and moved on to somebody else yeah and that's that's exactly what we happened. just w- yeah we just wish um they can put more effort in terms of like clearing things up with uh, when, when people do make you know, a curious inc- uh, inquisitions or like, uh, you know, like share a little bit more of what they're actually doing and yeah. uh, let, let us know what's going on on the ground. Yeah. yeah. So this is the whole thing. I mean, I think we, we should exactly what Mark said. We should be able to openly talk about our experiences with any organizations and see and go, look, that's my experience with them. And that should, they should be paying attention to that. All of them yeah. should be. If someone's well, I offered, I offered to do, um, and this is real. I offered to do a fundraiser for them. And I yeah. said, I think that we could raise more money in one day than any other controvert, uh, con- any other, you know, fundraiser you, you, anybody's ever done before. Yeah. I mean, I've done one for myself and, 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 ra- and, and it's never been done before or after that amount in that short a period of time. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to do it for them. But there was no follow-up, no communication. Just make a video and give us the money, and that's it. And I'm like, well, I'm going to get some more details here. And, you know, let's, let's, um, let's figure out some things out. You know, you know, maybe yeah. – I thought maybe their ears would perk up a little bit and be like, okay. You know, maybe, maybe they just didn't know what I would do for them or, or anything about it. Or they didn't care yeah. because who knew? But this was in person. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, and, the uh, whole concept – of their organization to me it's great i love the whole idea of it and i know people Mm. who've been there and so on but no one can tell me much and that's you know so i just don't know honestly i'm in the same position as you in the dark yeah Yeah. Yeah. so and and that's even after conversations and things as well so i still just don't know to be honest what actually occurs and so that's yeah that's the concern there obviously now, yeah, I mean, if they become more transparent and so on, maybe that would change, right? 
No, but somebody's gonna have a so different far. opinion. They'll be like, "Oh, they are incredibly transparent." Blah blah blah. And I and I hate that a name came up. That's why I didn't want to say who I've given money to before because I'm not going to um, get into that. But you know, if if that's the consensus of a, of, a, of an organization, that's a, couple, a few people have had. Yeah, that I mean, the thing is, if there's we can't all be they, wrong. They should be paying attention to that, and they should probably adjust how they're dealing with people and the transparency and things like that. Uh, that's yeah. you know, that's it's incumbent on them and beneficial to them if they're doing good work that they need to make sure everyone knows what that good work is, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. You want to get people to care. You want people yeah. to get excited. You want people to be passionate and to actually do something. We need to know what to do. Show you got to put us into that. Yeah. They're making. Yeah. With that said, this yeah. is an unfiltered conversation, so I guess I yeah. just don't care. I mean, <laughs> it is what it is. So. And that's what I like about it. So, yeah, yeah I but. mean, this is the point is that it, it's been frustrating for a long time. I've always, I've always wondered, you know, people have talked about biotopes for years and years as we got to promote freshwater conservation but how like how how really how yeah well get people to buy sustainably raised fish that's great too but it's not enough it's not nearly no. enough Th this needs to get into higher circles it needs to get into government attention things like that yeah. at some point at least large ngos and so on and funding and things like that to do real things like actually you know, conserving a section of a river that, or whatever, or I'll give you an example. There's, um, there's an organization in, in Nigeria for a river that most people never heard of called the river Ethiop. And they've had a conservation organization for more than 20 years. Now I don't know them that well, but they seem to be illegitimate and they have connections with, with reputable organizations and so on. They have an organization called Ethiop River Trust, and they that river is being destroyed by oil spills and a lot of other things. And it's an absolutely gorgeous, crystal clear, spring-fed river. It's one of the most beautiful rivers in the world with a really amazing cichlid fauna and um, lampeyes and all kinds of things there, beautiful plants, and looks like a, almost like a coral reef because it's just crystal clear blue water. Almost no one's ever heard of this place. You know, they're, yeah. they're trying to get known and get some recognition and, and efforts. It's very difficult there because it's a, it's a little bit, you know, difficult area of, of Nigeria. But wow, like, that's just one example of hundreds and hundreds or thousands. Well, of right now, it's, it's, it's giving me anxiety because this is definitely overwhelming. Like, it seems like everything's so helpless and hopeless, and I don't know what to do. And yeah. I've made attempts over the years, and I've done everything that I possibly felt like I could to the point where I got burned it felt like a few times yeah. and um, I think step one is this Michael um, email me those links to both Shoal as well as the Biotope um, the the Biotope website and mm -hmm. of course your company website as well and yep. um, do do you personally want to shout anything out like do you have like Instagram YouTube anything like something um, your company anything I, like my that my Instagram is tiny I'm hoping to grow it a little yeah. bit but um, Shout it out. not at this point but yes at some point I definitely will and I, I will share that with you so but okay. for now the NDS for sure Shoal and the Biotope contest are, are a great start for all Good. of that send me yeah. those links email them all three oh, of those to me <laughs> And, if, and of course, TMK Aquarius. <laughs> yeah, no, so, he's, he got sure his attention. Follow, like <laughs> Never again. Yeah, so uh, I think that's a, a, a step one for everybody. I invite you guys that are listening to uh, go in the description of this video um, and uh, visit these websites and see if any of this interests you to the point where you want to do something mm. as well. And, you know, maybe, maybe somebody listening does have an idea that yep. could start to impact real change you never know and you mentioned like you oh, though, that people might not listen or that you'd be surprised who listens or watches my videos like it's yeah. just sometimes it's like incredibly surprising um and all you know it just takes one person to start change mm -hmm. and it could be an average listener that has a great idea that leaves a comment and what to do next or yeah. you know so we'll leave it at that i think my uh yep. You know, I shout out to, to Mark see again. Some <laughs> entries for the biotope contest, at least. I want to see people when is get it? interested, excited, and inspired to do something. I'll check out the website. Maybe I'll do like a little 10 gallon tank or what else do I got? You know, 20 gallon tank or something like that. I don't think I would cool. do one in a 120 or a 180 or anything like that. And that's the smallest tanks that are out here right now. But, you know, I'm, maybe I'll build like a really long. You remember the office aquarium where it was like eight feet long, but it was only eight inches wide, and eight inches tall? That was cool. Maybe I could do something like that again. But, yeah. You know, uh, 
thanks for thanks for coming on and dedicating so much of your time today, Michael. Thanks for Thank listening you. to me rant, and I really appreciated your stories. We'll probably have to get you in uh, again at some point because I always feel like these podcasts just scratch the surface yeah. of, of yeah, the things that we could possibly yeah. talk about. Yeah. <laughs> we could do a joint one for NDS or whatever. Yeah, at some yeah. point. At some point, although I am sick of uh, hearing Mark's voice, so um, just give, give me a, give me a few months or a couple of years, and I might be able to stomach him a little bit longer. <laughs> but yeah, uh, that was another episode of Aquariums Unfiltered, my fellow tank banks. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Hope you guys uh, get as frustrated as I do and as mad as I do about some of these things, because you know emotion and passion will drive change, and uh, it, it's literally only going to take one of one person to to get the ball rolling and one of them could be you so keep that in mind when you visit the links in the description below again thank you for joining me michael mark leave me alone uh and everybody else i'll see you guys in the next video (laughs) joey thanks so much appreciate it of course thank you